Welcome on in golf fans, it's your boy GS Luke here with our DFS core plays for the Honda Classic, my hometown event, super excited to be on site all week, but here in this video, excited to bring you my top end plays towards the $8,000 plus range for DraftKings, gonna go over some of those stud tier options, which in this weaker field event, right, not the elevated event we had there for the Phoenix Open, or of course there at Riviera, but still a lot of contests, a lot of money to be had, and for us players that are playing golf week in and week out right that are you know doing this research it's going to pay off at this sort of event that 6 7k range is loaded with names that the casual fan won't be all that familiar with so if you're somebody that's already been you know digging into the weeds don't be worried at all you'll be just fine you'll feel just at home on these sort of weeks but for the sort of casuals they're all going to hunker around the same kind of plays. And with a PGA National that ends up being one of the more volatile tracks all year, has water on 15 of 18 holes, a scoring average that was the hardest there three years ago, is routinely in the top three hardest courses on all of the PGA Tour schedule. And that's pretty much regardless of wind. If it ends up getting windy, forget it. It'll be by far the most difficult track. Um, a lot of those chalky, high-owned players tend to really flame out here. So if you're somebody that's willing to do the research search, grind out there, take that game theory approach. This could be a big week for you. So in this video, like I said, going to focus towards the top of the board and go over four of my top plays and outright bets priced $8,000 and above on DraftKings. Hopefully by the end, you'll have a solid idea of a few players to consider getting some leverage to in large field GPPs. Just like last week we had with the Colin Morikawa, guys like Bill Zalatoris that were, you know, maybe with Morikawa, not so loaned, but with Bill Zalatoris, certainly one of the better leverage plays you could have had there on the slate. Hopefully bring you some fire on that end and not bring you guys like Matt Fitzpatrick, who ended up being a little bit more injured than we thought. So uh, that was the one dud last week. Rory McIlroy also could have had a John Rahm up there, but you know, it was kind of like choosing between the two best players in the world. Uh, you know, you either went with the ROM heater, or you went with the Rory bounce back. And of course, the Rominator went out there and showed everybody who was boss. So last week, I wasn't on ROM. That would have been great because outside of that, we hit all over the board. I mean, Sahith the Gala, Lee Hodges towards, you know, $6,100 ended up hitting for us. So overall, it was a pretty solid DFS week. But this time around, let's go ahead and nail this top end range, right? Let's get the John Rahm the winner this time around. So with that being said, a lot to get into. Let's get this preview started. All right, as we typically do here, let's take a look at the golf course in my key metrics for success before talking about our top play. So uh, why we're targeting the top plays, right? Let's get an idea for the course. So over here on the key stats tab, um, it's first worth noting, kind of like I said during the intro, this is one of the hardest courses on all of the PGA Tour. And on top of that, extremely volatile. If you're not on top of your game, your score is going to go sideways quickly. So for players that maybe are losing on approach or even just slightly losing off the tee, that is going to be magnetized sometimes five or even tenfold. There are times where players are losing five, six strokes on approach in a single round. And same thing off the tee, of course. So you're looking for players that are coming in with form, but a little bit more than just that. You're looking for players that are extremely consistent. So at the top of the board, I mean, we have the putting stats, the approach stats you're used to seeing. Um, it's worth noting that we have pure Bermuda grass greens this week. So I am looking at that. I'm um, a little bit more than most. In terms of your iron play, there's a slightly more emphasis on the mid iron ranges, that 150 to 175, 175 to 200, and that 200 to 225 yard range um, are slightly emphasized here more than most weeks. You can see three, three and a half percent weighting. But the key differentiators are these bogey avoidance type stats, where you have bogey avoidance here around the green stats, sand saves, um, shots gained at the floor to swing. I mean, even shots gained out of gnarly Bermuda rough um, are all things that I'm looking at here. Driving distance, I have to say, is definitely the name of the game over driving accuracy, as pretty much every single player is going to be laying up off the tee. And you may ask yourself, if everyone's laying up off the tee, then why are we also worried about driving distance? It's because if you're laying up to the same exact spot on the golf course, if you're hitting into some of the long par threes, some of the really difficult par threes that you have here around PD, PGA National, um, having the extra distance means that you might be hitting one, two, maybe even three clubs less than some of your competitors, which is a huge advantage, especially when you have to lay up to the same exact spot. So uh, maybe club head speed might be a better way to measure this, but driving distance, it's been correlated to success over the years, which is surprising, right? When you think about um, how many times players are laying up around this track, um, but still holds. And it's both from the eye test and the correlation perspective, but a lot of just saving par stats, right? Like I said, bogey avoidance, 
In terms of your comps, I'm looking at TPC Southwind, looking at Sawgrass, a couple um, in case of player championship, right? A Florida track um, up there in Memphis there for the St. Jude, and then Muirfield Village. All three tracks feature a ton of penalty shots, um, lots of water in all three properties. And on top of that, you have Bermuda Grass for the top two, right? For Southwind and Sawgrass. And though the agronomy is a little bit different down there for the Memorial, uh, you're still talking about one of the most difficult courses on, on all the PGA Tour. And also, a Nicholas design, which he's not the true designer of PGA National of this track that was the Fazio brothers, but he has done three renovations on property. So certainly has left his stamp and is, you know, his crown jewel is over there at Mirafield Village. So uh, a lot of influence on that end. So with all of that in mind, we're looking for players this week that you know, can keep part on the scorecard, right? That's very clear with some of the, you know, around the green stats that we were looking at, but also players that are Bermuda specialists. And when we take a look at the board here, that's not really going to lead us to these top end players, right? We weren't really talking about like approach play being super important here, right? I wasn't talking about driving distance being like one of our number one key stats, right? Number one key stat was shots gained putting. So up top, I would heavily advise against taking chalk. And at this point, it's too early to know who's going to be the highest owned on the slate. But I can tell you for a fact that Billy Horschel is not going to be one of those players. He's going to be moderately owned. I would expect people to play him because um, he is in the 9K range and is, at least in terms of track record, probably the best player, at least, maybe the second best player in the field behind Sun GM at this point. But $9,700, 30 to 1 in the outright market is disrespectful for Billy Ho. He doesn't have any top end, right, like top five finishes here over his last five years, but has been steady. You can see has made the cut in three of his four trips, a couple top 16 finishes. Um, again, nothing super flashy. So maybe that's why he's just 9700 bucks. Maybe it's the recent form that's been a little bit off, right? He's missed two of his three cuts, um, finished tied for 32nd two times out there at Waste Management. So it's not like he's been as sharp as self, but must we remind ourselves, this is a multiple winner on the PGA Tour, won last year at Memorial, which again was one of the three comp courses that I'm looking at, and plays exceptionally difficult courses way better than the average, right? His shots gained under hard conditions, firm and fast conditions, windy conditions are all a huge plus because Billy Horschel kind of has that classic old timer game, right? Doesn't swing very hard, has that low ball flight, is able to manipulate his ball flight. And while he's not going to beat you with his brawn, he certainly does so with his finesse. That's kind of what he's known for. And when you get him at a course where you have to finesse it around there, kind of like a Honda Classic, right? But you're not hitting a lot of driver off the tee. I think that plays into his advantage where he can lean into his irons, which can be a little bit sporadic, but when he's playing his best golf, he's capable of gaining six, seven strokes on approach. That's what you saw him do at the Memorial. You saw him do it at the API when he nearly won last year as well, um, which not a surprise. All of these tournaments are kind of at this time of the year, right? Memorial may be a slightly later into the schedule, but he played decently here last time around, right? Nearly won there at the API. Players is typically one of his better tournaments, right? He's from Jacksonville, so it makes sense. I really like Billy Horschel this week, and he's the kind of player that can go out there and win without having form. He's proven enough. We've seen this guy enough on tour to kind of know who he is, and it's an exceptional ball striker when his game's there, and on Bermuda grass is where he tends to do his best putting. So I like it. I like the event history. The recent form, the shots gained metrics, um, aren't going to be the reason for playing Billy Horschel, but despite not having the best form, right, he's still gaining close to half a stroke per round on approach, gaining around the green and gaining with the putter, albeit not nearly as prolific with the putter as what we're used to seeing. But at a course where you don't have to hit driver off the tee, this negative 0.6 strokes off the tee isn't so worrisome because he's not going to have that club in hand very often, whereas he's had that in hand for essentially every single drive of the last few weeks, given how difficult the courses were off the tee. So I like his chances here. It's a bounce back spot. But like I said up top, you want to take pivots. And I'm almost certain, again, it's a little early, so I can't tell you for a fact that he's going to be a pivot play up top. But I would imagine that he's lower owned than even a Chris Kirk, might be lower owned than an Alex Noren when it's all said and done, and definitely going to be lower owned than a Lowry and a Sun JM. 
which makes him just all that much better to get to right there is a pivot play and I'd argue that he has more winning upside than every other player in this field um, which is what makes that 30 to 1 number just so disrespectful next up we've got Aaron Wise another player that has had a decent track record here around the Honda now last time out missed the cut I played him last year so uh, that was a little bit tilting but I'm not going to let that get me off of him not going to hold grudges against Aaron Wise because he paid me off there a couple years ago nearly won the golf tournament in fact was your leader through two rounds and then kind of fell off over the weekend but he wasn't nearly the player that he is today and we'll, we'll circle back on that here in a second 35th back there three years ago and 33rd five years ago and he's kind of been known as a florida killer he's made a lot of cuts down here in florida whether it's the players whether it's over there at the valspar he's just time and time again gone out there even posted top 15 finishes at a much higher rate than the rest of the schedule it might be agronomy based because you can see he's not the best of late. I mean, his putting numbers of late have been ridiculous. In fact, it's been his strength. So if we look at the differential, it's not going to give you the best idea. But this negative 0.11 strokes is actually a positive to his three-year baseline. And that's where you're getting the shots gained Bermuda numbers from. It's a th player's three-round baseline on Bermuda. He's closer to a negative 0.3 shot baseline just in terms of his putting over that stretch. But of late, for whatever reason, this guy has figured out the damn putter. And even the around the green play, the short game has become a huge strength for him. And super surprising here is that he's losing on approach. So when I was looking at the shots gained before, I was putting them into my spreadsheet here. Uh, I was in Bizarro World. I had to double check my shots gained metrics. And uh, truth be told, they were there, right? He struggled a little bit at courses you really would not expect him to struggle at. So here you can see he's missed the cut. Um, this is the recent form here, waste management. Missed the cut there at the Amex. Um, hasn't played every single week which is kind of surprising so maybe he's working on his game working on a swing or something like that there's no way to tell um that's kind of concerning that he hasn't played a ton but you know the course history speaks for itself and kind of like Will Zalatoris last week I'm getting that same kind of vibe here where we know who this guy is right we know Will Zalatoris right plays hard course as well Aaron Wise has a few red flags going on where it looks like maybe he's not the best course fit here, maybe not in the best recent form, but we know he always plays well this time of year. And over the last year, he's just become such a more consistent player than what we've seen over the last four or five years. And that's what I wanted to circle back on. Wouldn't we expect him to improve on that past track record, right? Now that he's gone so much more consistent, now that he's somehow able to gain with the flat stick, now he's going to a course where he's been able to ball strike the heck out of it the last four or five years. Not only do I think Aaron Wise is a good fantasy play, probably going to be low owned because of some of the concerns with the form, but I think he could win this golf tournament. And another player like Horschel that I've gone out there and bet outright, the silly thing is, is that Aaron Wise has lower odds to win, right? You have to pay more to go out there outright for him than Billy Ho. So that's why I think the 30 to one was so disrespectful over there. But once again, another solid play I'm getting to, um, kind of taking a chance on somebody with without the best recent form, kind of like a Billy Horschel up there. But this is the week to do that. It's a course with so much volatility, Course history tends to be pretty correlated to success around here. It's one of the better course history tracks around the PGA Tour. So count me in. On all right, boys, just a quick heads up. If you want access to all of my plays this week, all my modeling that is blacked out on the spreadsheets, make sure to check out my Patreon page. There's a link in the description of the video. It is $10 a month. Gets you access to all of that data, all the behind the scenes access, my modeling, all that fun stuff to use for yourself, right? To copy and paste into your optimizers ownership when it's posted there so you can also use that for building your gpp lineups i do that i update them multiple times throughout the week and on there i post all my prop analysis whether it's for dfs whether it's for prize picks over there at underdog it's where you can find all of my behind the scenes stuff and uh, make sure to check it out if you're looking for that but uh back to the action guys let's go over our last two core plays all right, third up, we've got JT Poston, who is once again a player I'm expecting to be relatively overlooked, and a lot of it has to do with the guys priced around him. Thomas Dietrich, a name I've already heard thrown around a few times over the last six hours or so since pricing came out. Taylor Pendrith, a few people have proclaimed it Pendrith Week. Um, you have Adam Svensson, who was immediately bit down from 60 to 1 to 35 to 1. So a lot of people were jumping on that, you know, Canadian, right, who's had some success here around PJ National with a top 10 last year. Top 10 last week, of course, won at the RSM Classic. So I get it, right? A lot of names to choose from here. But JT Poston 
is kind of a sleeping giant of his own, and I'll show you guys why. So the recent form has been hit or miss. You can see has made a few cuts of late, has actually missed a few cuts too, right? So two missed cuts in a row coming in at the elevated events. Not great, but he's not the best over there in POA. So we'll circle back on the agronomy side here in a second. But look at this, sixth, 21st place. So he's been, like I said, boomer bust, right? Top five finish, well, nearly top five right there with a six. Uh, another top 25 finish there. Uh, and a couple missed cuts. So it's kind of hard to get a read on how he's playing. But a lot of it could have been agronomy based. Over there on the West Coast, he is by far his worst on POA. And then you can see on Bermuda, he's by far his best, right? Gaining 0.34 shots per round. Um, a whole third of a shot better per round than his baseline. And when you take a look at the shots gained metrics, you'll see that he's been getting it done across the board, right? Gaining on approach, gaining off the tee, um, about a neutral with the around the green and the putting, which is kind of subpar for JT. He's known for being one of the better short game players on tour. So you would hope for that to turn around. But I mean, look at the eerie similarities between him and Svensson, right? Svensson may be a little bit more consistent, but I would much rather have Poston's ball striking than Svensson's. And sure, the huge difference here is what it, where it comes around the green. But JT Poston, like I said, is known for being a good around the green player. So I would expect that to turn around at some point. And the course history between the two is also kind of similar. I mean, look at this, right? Three out of four made cuts. Now he doesn't have that top 10 finish there, but all Svensson has is two made cuts, right? And one of them was a top 10. I mean, Pendrith, right? One made cut. It was a top 25. These guys around him, at least as of my read early here on Monday, I think might be twice as owned as JT Poston. And they look pretty much the same across the board when it comes to shots gained. In fact, um, Taylor Pendrith top is probably the worst out of the three when it just comes to the stats, particularly because he's gaining a bunch with the putter. He's kind of not known for that, right? He's much better with the ball striking stats. Um, I'd rather have JT Poston. So all of these are going to be dependent on ownership. Just keep that in mind, right? I'm expecting these guys to be relatively low owned. You know, JT Poston may be in the 12 to 15% range at the very most, hopefully lower than that when it comes to his ownership, uh, making them exceptional large field tournament plays. Uh, and our last core play here is going to be Cam Davis, $8,100. And if you're looking for a guy in form, really with all four of these picks, run the other direction. Because um, once again, it's a guy who's coming in with slightly dicey form. Uh, in fact, he's missed his last three cuts. Last time he made the cut was back there at the Sony, I believe, 32nd place finish, which is a course where you lay up off the tee, which is a good sign for him, particularly because early in the tournament was playing really well, um, really faltered towards the weekend there. But the event history, at Honda has some top end finishes, right? Has made his last three cuts, has a top 10 finish there with an eighth place there three years ago. And the shots gained metrics are a little bit deceiving here because he's still gaining with his approach playing off the tee, right? He's still doing his ball striking thing. He has just been atrocious around the green and with the putter. Now you can't have that continue. But one thing we know Cameron Davis for is Typically, he's right about a neutral with the around the green, right? He's not usually losing two thirds of a stroke per round. Hopefully, he's gotten that figured out. He hasn't played that much of late because he didn't qualify for a lot of these like big time events, right? So, where is he? $8,100. He played last week at the Genesis, but didn't get into waste management. I right? took the week off before that. He did have those two missed cuts. One of them was the Amex, what was the other one? The Farmers Insurance, um, which are relatively ugly. It's why the shots gain metrics, especially around the green. He bled so many strokes around the green at the Farmers. Um, even over there at events where he was making the cut, was not able to roll his rock. So just has sabotaged himself over this small sample size. But if you're willing to throw that aside, give him a little bit of a break, He's a good play on paper, right? He's typically one of the chalkier guys we see over there. It's like 20% owned, sometimes at least like 15 to 18% owned at higher prices in weaker field events. So why not give him a shot at a course that he has seemingly had some success at at the past? All right, guys, that is all I've got for this week's core plays. Before you're hopping out of here, go ahead, comment down below who you've got as your winner. Only thing is, can't be in the 10 or 9K range. Got to be a little bit more creative about it. Let's go 8K range and lower. What you're thinking in terms of a winner? I'll go ahead and say, it's going to say Taylor Pendrith, could say Adam Spencer, but let's go JT Poston, right? Let's go with one of our core plays. I think that he's got real upside here and pretty much the same kind of profile as a few of those other popular bets around him. So I'll go the uh, unconventional route, but go ahead, let me know your thoughts down in the comments. And as per usual, going to have even more content throughout the week. And because we'll be on site, 
even more from the course. So tomorrow, it'll be our value plays, drop in towards the first half of the day. And then there on Wednesday, I'll be walking the course, going to the Pro-Am, trying to get a scouting report on a few players on the range, a few guys on the golf course for their Pro-Ams, and uh, hopefully bring you guys the goods for the live stream. So we'll be doing that Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern, like we always do. And there is where I'll be giving you guys all of those little insights, little tidbits. Now, if you're on the Discord, you're on the Patreon page, not only do you get access to the spreadsheets, but I'll also be going over, taking pictures from site, maybe videos of a few players, giving you guys a little bit of even extra info there, and I'll be doing it live. In fact, it might even be going live there. We'll have to see there in the, in the Discord chat. But either way, looking forward to it. Should be a lot of fun. See you guys there for the live stream on Wednesdays. And if you haven't already, go ahead, smash that like button, and make sure you are subscribed to the channel if you haven't already, so you don't miss any of the content and videos to come. See you guys there for the stream, and best of luck with all of your lineups or outright bets for this week.